Okay, good morning. This is the uh, series of uh, seminars. In this case, uh, we will have a colloquia presented by Dr. Jesus Tuala from Instituto de Astrofisica, de Radio Astronomia and Astrofisica in Campus Morelia in Mexico. He will talk about recent findings on Nova Explosions and our uh, Severo Ochoa director will introduce him properly. Isabel. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank, thanks again for, for being here, for attending the web, web blog here from the, our Severo Ochoa uh, program. And uh, especially welcome, Jesus Tuala. Thank you very much for ac accepting our invitation to provide um, this, um, this seminar. And uh, as I usually do, I, I, I will make a, a, a brief overview of uh, your biography in general, and I mean scientific of course. Uh, Dr. Jesus Tuala obtained his bachelor's uh, degree in physics in, at the University of Sinaloa in Culiacán in Mexico, and then his master's degree at the Centro de Astronomía y Astrofísica in, in, of the UNAM in Morelia. And then a second master and his PhD degree here at the, at the IAA in Granada, co-supervised by Dr. Martín Guerrero from the, from the IAA and Dr. Uh, Jane Arthur in Iria in Mexico. And he defended he, his thesis in 2014, uh, a thesis with a dial X-ray emission from hot bubbles in nebulae around evolved stars. Then he got his first postdoc uh, here at the IAA. But then quite fast, I mean, quite immediately, he went to Taiwan uh, in 2015 uh, when he obtained a distinguished postdoc fellowship at the Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics of Academia Sinica in, in Taiwan, uh, where he worked with Professor Yuhua Chu. In June uh, 2017, he was hired uh, in Mexico as a level C associate researcher at UNAMS in, in uh, Institute of Radio Astronomy and Astrophysica in, in, in Morelia. Since then, he's been um, working also as a teacher, involved in UNAM's astronomy master's program, imparting lectures and supervising students at different undergraduate and postgraduate levels from UNAM and also from other universities throughout Mexico. He has also been involved in a large number of outreach activities in Mexico, in Spain, and in Taiwan. He has participated uh, and he participates still uh, and the Time Allocation Committee for the Chandra X-ray Observatory and Subaru Telescope in Mauna Kea, Hawaii. And he's been a, a project evaluator for research uh, programs in Belgium, Chile, and Mexico. Among the awards he has received, he has got the UNAM Alfonso Caso Medal for the best postgraduate student in 2010. And additionally, he has been awarded a level one in the Sistema Nacional de Investigadores, ESANI, in Mexico just a year after obtaining his, uh, his PhD degree. So he's, um, since, I mean, every, uh, ever, he's been a very promising young scientist because he's very young, as you see. His scientific areas of interest are stellar evolution, astrophysics of interstellar medium and circumstellar medium around evolved stars using theoretical and observational tools. And among them, among the observations, he had led and um, particip participated in a large number of observing proposals using ground-based observatories, for instance, several telescopes in La Palma, including GTC, and in San Pedro Martí in New Mexico, as well as space facilities, like the Hubble Space Telescope, XMM Newton, Chandra, and Sophia. Dr. Tuala studies uh, planetary and wolf rayet nebulae, suburbubbles, and recently, novae around binary systems. And today, he is talking about recent findings about nova explosions. So thanks again, Jesús, and that. This is your turn. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Isabel, René, Manuel, Martin, for inviting me, uh, for letting me sp uh, speak a little bit of our, our recent work. I am very happy. Uh, I won't say to be back, but I'm always happy to be in contact with people of IAA. Um, so thank you again for being here. Uh, it's 5.30 in the morning for me, so I hope you enjoy and watch it, uh, looking at my face. But okay, let's start with the science. Uh, so this is um, a talk, and what I, I will give you a little bit of, um, of ideas on what we know uh, of Nova explosions, uh, Nova shells, binary systems, and uh, 
most of the work that I will present is in collaboration, of course, with Martin Guerrero from your institute uh, and other people uh, in Mexico, uh, Gerardo Ramos, Edgar Santa Maria, Lawrence Saban in UNAM also, among other students. So my, my main goal, goal in this, with this talk is to let you know or convince you that now we are still very hot in the sense that we can still uh, uh, learn things from them. There are things that we, we have discovered in the recent years and things that we can uh, extrapolate in order to study stellar evolution, binary interactions, explosions, hydrodynamics, and a lot of physical effects. They can be used as laboratories for physics in astronomy. So the talk is divided like this. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an idea of what our novi, uh, how are uh, they uh, presented to us, what we know about nova shells, remnants, uh, and finally I will uh, talk about three recent papers that we have published in the past uh, two years. Uh, two of them about the nova, uh, the evolution of nova remnants. And finally, uh, I will talk about X-ray emission from hot bubbles in Nova, Nova shells. And I will give you some final remarks. So, uh, so let me start by saying that stars are the main actors shaping and changing physical properties of all galaxies and the universe we, uh, we see. This uh, is it's done by a combination of different effects, in particular winds, uh, ionizing photon fluxes and supernovae explosions. So in some cases, for example, this is the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magnetic Club. Uh, stars uh, are located in conglomerates, in groups. So the combination of all these effects create these very big shells of hot bubbles expanding and pushing away the interstellar medium. So stars are dynamically changing the properties of the, of the galaxies. So we can use the nebulae that are formed because of the feedback to study and trace uh, stellar evolution and their progenitors, for example. This is a very nice image of the, hot, uh, the bubble nebula. So you see the progenitor that is here. So we see the reach of the stellar wind, of a single star, and then the rest of the material is, is ionized by the stars. So single stars can create uh, structures around them, which we can use to trace their um, uh, evolutionary paths. So NOVI, let me start saying by uh, NOVI are the result of binary evolution. So we now know that in the, in, at least in the galaxies that we, we can measure, binary systems are the most common system, stellar systems. In particular, low mass stars are the most numerous. And so most of them are, like, are uh, presented to us in, in binary or triple systems. Um, so let me start with a, a system with two uh, stars, one the primary with uh, two solar masses and a secondary with one solar mass. So we know of, uh, because of stellar evolution that the most massive will, will evolve first. Uh, it will inflate these outer layers. So at some point, if the binary is it's, uh, relatively close, so the progenitor will, will fill his uh, Rochelle lobe and material will start going, flowing from the, from the uh, primary into the secondary. Um, and the secondary will start increasing its mass. So at some point the primary, which was, was the most massive, is not now the most massive. And maybe from C into D, uh, the primary will go into planetary nebula phase, becoming a white dwarf, a hot white dwarf. And then subsequently, the now most massive star in the system will inflate these uh, outer layers, then again, again, fill in the Rochelle lobe, and then material will, will start going into the white dwarf. So we know that the material uh, will start uh, increasing the mass of the white dwarf, and then finally, until it reaches the Chandra Sekar limit, which is about 1.4 solar masses, so the star becomes degenerate and it explodes as a supernova in 1A. Um, but in particular, we are interested in this um, uh, phase of the evolution of binary systems, where a companion, a red inflated companion, transfers mass into a white dwarf. Um, so what we have is that the, the, the wind or the material from the red companion star, it does not fall directly into the white dwarf. 
because of angular momentum, so we will have a disk, an accretion disk that will form around the white dwarf while it, it keeps accreting material. Um, in some cases, which is most of them, um, the disk, so the, the, the accretion rate is slow, so the disk will become degenerate. Uh, so you, the pressure and temperature will increase, and at the base of the, the white dwarf, we will have the conditions to ignite uh, and to create a thermonuclear ex explosion that will ignite the, most of the hydrogen in the surface of the white dwarf. So it's, it's, it's an explosion very similar to what we call a helium flash will be produced. And this is what we call NOVI, a NOVA. So this is just a cartoon of the Red Companion. The, the material goes through the uh, Rochelle lobe and then the aggression disk around the white curve. So at the end, so we have uh, something like this, so binary system, and then material that goes ejected because of the explosion from the white dwarf. This is a very uh, simplified cartoon, but it's, it's just for a matter of uh, illustration. Um, so novi events are um, the scaled down versions of supernovae. So most, most of the energy uh, is irradiated as kinetic energy, and the rest is gone as neutrinos. So the kinetic energy of the ejecta is about 10 to the minus seven times uh, less energetic than supernovae rem, uh, explosions. And the ejecta has masses about 10 to the minus four uh, solar masses with uh, velocities that can reach a thousand kilometers per second. Um, but we know that the explosion is not dramatic enough to disrupt the white dwarf. So the white dwarf survives this explosion and the, the mechanism or the, uh, all the process can be repeated because still we have the, the red companion star transferring mass into the white dwarf. So uh, a new uh, accretion disk will be formed after the explosion. Um, we now know that uh, in, so the repetition uh, uh, can be uh, uh, can have a recurrence of in time scales of uh, months up to ten to the five years. But astronomers we call it a recurrent novi, novi to those that we have seen explode at least two or three times in uh, an astronomer's lifetime. Lifetime. But in general, we think that all, most novi will be uh, will be repetitive process within. Uh, different time scales. So just to be uh, to to present an example of how powerful the effects of nova explosions are. Um, recently, in 2019, there was a paper in Nature uh, presented by Darnley, Darnley and collaborators, where they demonstrated that a single binary system, uh, a recurrent nova, has produced a very large. Shell, you can see this is something like 140 parsecs times 90 parsecs. So this this binary system has been exploding at least one time per year since a million years ago. So a single low mass star system is able to to disrupt a very large volume of the interstellar medium. This is this system is located in the galaxy M31. Um, we also know that novi are um, capable of synthesizing heavier elements contributing to the metallicity of their surroundings. Uh, since the 90s, we actually. Yeah. Since the 90s, um, we specifically know that novi can, are producers of, of elements of as lithium. So I don't know if you remember, but lithium is. is, is we know that we think that is one of the elements that has uh, formed because of the Big Bang explosion, but uh, models and observations do not quite uh, fit when one compares them. So, no, we have been um, uh, suggested to be this uh, enrich enrichers of lithium in the interstellar medium. So, at least this is what we think. Uh, it's because of, of models. So, this is. Uh, uh, prediction of uh, abundances from Nova explosion from Margarita Hernández in Barcelona. So you see that lithium can go to twice the solar value, for example, for this specific case. Um, okay, so we have the explosion. So we have mass that has been ejected and injected into the interstellar medium. 
so this will create a shell, so a shell that is interactive, interacting with the interstellar medium. Uh, here I present some examples of how uh, of Novi, Nova shells, uh, from the book Classical Novi uh, from Boat and Evans in 2008. So one of the things that you can see is that most, more or less, they all look elliptical or spherical with uh, clumpy appearances. And in some cases, we can actually see some uh, bipolarity. For example, here are our pic pixies. You see some bipolar ejection here. Maybe, or in the case of FH, uh, Ser, for example, no? or the DQ Hercules, which is more or less uh, elliptical or ellipsoidal, if you if you want to say it more elegantly. Um, so since the 90s has been, there are several works uh, that have been numerical works that have been addressing the formation of Nova Nova remnants. In particular, I want to show you this, this work, which is one of the most uh, active uh, groups in numerical simulations from Nova, Nova shell formation. So this is a 2D numerical simulation. So what, what they do, so these authors and the, what the people still do, is that you start with uh, some kind of like a disc or a torus, a density torus, density enhancement, and then you eject or do you inject uh, kinetic energy that, of course, will blow out the polar regions of the, the simulation, and it will have more pressure on the on the equatorial uh, regions. So you will create structures like this, something like that is ellipsoidal with uh, so some ellipses projected on top of the, the expanding shells. Um, these same authors have, have been published a lot of papers. And what they realize is that we actually don't know much about how much mass is in, in this uh, disk. So we don't know the pressure that it, it will persist the explosion. So they argue that there's a lot of parameters that we actually still don't know, know the explosions. And one of the main thing is that depending on the orientation of the, the, the shells, we will have lots of uh, morphologies of Nova shells. This is very interesting. Uh, well, I, I find it very interesting. But of course, um, more recently, we started uh, seeing uh, 3D numerical simulations with more details. In particular, this is a, a work presented in 2017 by Orlando and company. So again, we start by defining a disk with a certain distribution of mass. This is not a disk that has been formed naturally because of the interaction of binary. It's just a predefined disk. And then we inject the kinetic energy. We just release energy into the disk. So I present you here different panels that uh, showing different uh, times of the interaction of different models with different density enhancements on the disk after 17 days. So you can see from the most massive uh, environment in the upper left panel to the less massive environment in the right uh, bottom panel. But in general, you can see that morphologies are more or less the same. And what we see is something that is kind of like ellipsoidal. And because of the instabilities, we, we, we have uh, rally taylor instabilities. We form these clumps and, and, and filaments that are being uh, ablated or photoapparated by the central star. Um, in some cases, the, the shells are more or less symmetric. If you take a look at the upper right panel, it's, more or less symmetric, but it, they have some specific cases which I like the most because it, it explains the most exotic uh, morphologies in Novi. Is that in some cases the material uh, may uh, interact with the binary system, so preventing to be the, the, the clumpy structure to be elliptical, perfectly elliptical. So. This kind of interaction is what we think is happening in some specific cases of Novi. So if you can take a look, for example, here to A.T. Gangri from Shara in 2012, you may see something like a, a ring-like structure, but it's lacking some emission in the um, southwest region of the, the, the image, for example. You can see it more clearly in the far UV image. So it's not a complete... Uh, disk or a ring. But in general, we think, so we now think that Novi should work something like this in the early moments. 
kind of like the torus is being disrupted because of the explosion and the the left the rest of the material is easily expanded to, towards the polar regions so what do we see in in nova uh, in nova shells so we this is um an observation of the dq hercules again uh, one of the most studied uh, novi uh, shells in the literature so what i am presenting you here is the image on the left panel of h alpha image of the nova shell and then you can see three positions of three different uh, slip uh, which, from which uh, spectra has been obtained from the William Herschel telescope. And this is the H alpha profile of the slip or position one. So you can see the velocity structure of the, the shell. And then you see the clumps that they have long tails which we know that they form because of instabilities and ablation and they probably are being photo evaporated from the central star. Uh, so the authors uh, produce uh, a model of uh, inclination angle and what we think we're uh, uh, looking at this, uh, this, the real structure of this, this uh, Nova shell, for example. So this is uh, in this cartoon on the right panel here. So, okay, so, uh, but one of the amazing things of nova shells is that we can actually trace their evolution in time, in human time scales. For example, this is uh, the no formation of nova shell around the GK Perseus nova. So this is a very early image from Mount Wilson Observatory in 1917. So you can see the binary system on the, the middle of the panel and then some emission starting to glow around the system by 1993, so this is, I think this, the size, I don't remember, but it's kind of like a one minute in, in size, each panel. So by 1993, this is, so the, the clumps have been disrupted, and this is how we, we in modern times, where we see G, G chi, K per se, uh, so here I'm gonna show you a movie that one of the students in our group uh, did, searching for all of the optical images that he could find in the public archives. Um, so this is, you can see that the, the year on the left, on the bottom left. So you can actually, we can actually study the morphology changes and hydrodynamics that Nova, Nova shells experience with time. So this is something that is not easily done for other, uh, systems, for example. They expand very fast and we can actually measure this in human time scales and we can use them as PhD thesis and projects. And although we, uh, we see that this, it looks like a firework, kind of like a firework expanding uh, into the interstellar medium, um, some people have worked on the dynamics of the kinematic structures of this, this uh, in particular GK Perseus, and they realized that it's, again, kind of like a toroid, toroidal structure and then the bipolar uh, structures, kind of like the simulations that I, I just showed. So let me start with the first uh, paper that we have worked on. And this has been uh, published in 2019. And uh, this is an object that resulted from this IFAS survey, which is the Isaac Newton, photometric H alpha something survey. Sorry, I don't remember. Um, so you can see this is one of those novi where it's not symmetric. Actually, we can see a clumpy ring of uh, better described it, H, uh, nitrogen line, and then some extra oxygen three line, which is very likely due to the interaction of the clumps with the interstellar medium. And some extra uh, layers uh, outer to uh, outside the nebula, you can more or less see here, but we don't see the counterpart of the, the other side of the, the expansion of the clumps. So this is very uh, asymmetric uh, nova. Uh, so what we did, so we obtained uh, multi-epoch imaging with different telescopes searching for everything uh, we can we could find, and then we obtained Nordic, Nordic Optical Telescope more recent images. 
So we want, what we wanted to do is to study the, the kinematical signatures of the expansion of the knots. Um, so we use different uh, uh, methods, but uh, let me just uh, simplify saying the, the following, saying that uh, we selected different clubs and studied the expansion. So we compared, as I just show you with the GK Perseus, so we have different images, we can compare the different images, and then we can study the pixel expansion of different, different, uh, different uh, features, for example. Um, this is an example of the comparison between the two, 2007 and 2016 images. So you can actually see the real expansion of the nitrogen. This is the nitrogen to uh, clumps. So what we do is, for, first of all, we have to align, carefully align the images and then study the expansion of the clumps. The, so we, what we find out is that the clumps, the nitrogen two clumps, expand faster than the oxygen-free skin. It's about double the expansion uh, of the, it's 0.1 arc seconds per pixel. And the oxygen-free has expansion 0.06 uh, arc seconds per pixel. And then we can actually compute the expansion velocity of these, this shell. Huh? Um, then again, let, what we think it happened here is that this is um, very asymmetric because very likely the explosion, of course, we know that they occurs, uh, it has to interact first with a, with a disk and probably the, the nitrogen to clumps is because of this the disruption of the disk and the binary system probably uh, uh, interacts with the ejecta so the ring is not complete. So we, we see a lack of emission in this, this region. Uh, but we can use the expansion of the clumps to test uh, uh, certain uh, scenarios of the expansion of the ejecta in Novi, for example, because we have different uh, epochs. So you see here, I'm showing you time versus the radius of, of the projected radius that we think uh, the, the, the clumps have, and also the expansion rate, different models. Um, so you see here the di diamonds and the error bars are the measurements. And then uh, overplot with different lines, there are different uh, predictions from different models. No? In blue, we have the free expansion, as similarly as the first uh, phase of a supernova and uh, ejection and evolution. And then in black, uh, as something similar as a set of Taylor expansion. So you can see that the, the, apparently the, the clumps, or they do not follow a free expansion, free expansion, uh, evolution, which means that very likely uh, the nova is not very, is not young and or that the, uh, the material has been swept by the interstellar medium, by the interaction with the interstellar medium has increased and now it's changing the dynamics or in, of the ejecta. It looks more or less, or the one that I like the most is the cell of Taylor expansion. And, and in this case, uh, the radius increases as the time as two fifth um, times. It's this set of Taylor expansion is the same as adiabatic expansion, very is the same as the supernovae evolution, the supernova remnant evolution. So well, we decided to follow our um, findings for this uh, nova shell, and then we started gathering information and observations from the supernovae. Um, I think in particular for me, the most interesting or the first thing that we have to do is to understand those that are more symmetric or elliptical or uh, the easy morphologies because we, we have more idea about those that in those cases are asymmetric. So in the 2020 paper, the first 2020 paper, uh, uh, Eduardo, Edgar Santamaria, uh, uh, he selected a sample of, uh, these are five uh, nova shells, and he did a very nice uh, job searching for different observations in different uh, catalogs and archives from different novae, where we could actually see by eye the angular expansion of these objects. So you can actually see in all of these cases, you can see by eye, we are comparing two epochs to different epochs, and then the color version is the the most uh, expanded image, but in colors. So you can see real expansion in time. 
from different uh, telescopes. So this is the, the whole sample and all the observations. We have uh, observations as old as 1956, in some cases, 1944. Uh, and then we can study, we can create, first of all, images or videos like this, where you can actually see the expansion of the particular of the Hercules. And we can more or less envisage the production of the clumps and the tails that are produced because of uh, hydrodynamical instabilities and uh, photo uh, evaporation because of the white earth. So we see, um, I'm gonna play it again. On the bottom, you can see the, the year from 1977 into 2018. And this is the age of uh, emission from the NOVA. In some cases, the images do not have the same quality, although we can, we can actually uh, see the, the formation of clumps and the, the tails from the, the, the result of hydrodynamical uh, effects. Um, in particular, one of the things that we see is that in this roundish elliptical novi, uh, there's no stopping them. So they, they, they seem that they are expanding as free, uh, free, uh, free expansions. They're, they are exhibiting free expansion uh, rates. These are different symbols here and different colors uh, are different novi. So we can actually, in, in, in most of the cases, we know the exact date of the explosion. And this is just time versus the uh, semi-minor axis in parsecs, for example. So most of them, there is all of them. We can easily say that they're expanding free, and then we can compute the expansion velocities. So this is very interesting for me. I, I this this result was very interesting for me. Um, in all cases, we can also. Uh, calculate the, the mass of the ejecta and we can estimate the mass of the sweat of uh, interstellar medium. And in all cases, we see that the mass of the shell is at least one uh, order of magnitude larger than the sweat, sweat of, sweat of uh, interstellar medium, which is why this is why we see that they're expanding freely so that the ejected mass has not been uh, stopped by the mass of the interstellar medium. Um, and we can also compute kinetic energies and then we can compare to those models and that predictions that I gave you in the, the introduction, which was around 10 to the 45. You can see the energetics are very similar to the predictions of the models. So this was a very, very nice uh, finding. In, I, I, I very like it. It was very easy, uh, straightforward to understand. So probably we see this because these are very young now. But um, we also, um, we can estimate uh, in how, how long these novi are, are going to uh, last. So how long we're going to keep seeing them as optical emitters. So we can compute the time where the, the, the flux is, is going down, down, down. And if this is going to be changing into different hydrodynamical phases. So what we actually uh, think it will happen is that they will keep expanding freely and they actually will uh, disappear. Uh, uh, they will be non-detected and they will still be expanding in, in free expansion phase. Very differently from, from this uh, asymmetric uh, novi, for example. And uh, finally, let me just go into this, uh, the hot bubbles. What we see about, what we know about hot bubbles in remnants. Um, there are not many uh, hot bubbles observed in Novi, so in, there's only one, there was only one, uh, which is GK Perseus. It was the first Nova shell detected to emit in extended X-ray emission. Uh, it was detected with uh, Rosat in 1999. And uh, subsequently, uh, other X-ray emission had been observed in this, this Nova, Chandra, Exome Newton, and Susaku. And what they see, most of them are, uh, conclude the same thing is that, again, the extended X-ray emission, which is blue in this image, uh, it is kind of like a scaled down version of a supernova uh, remnant. And the plasma, uh, the, the temperature of this X-ray emitting uh, plasma is estimated to be about 2 million uh, Kelvin. 
Um, it is not surprising that uh, uh, this uh, has this the Novi have uh, X-ray emission because one can use simple estimations for adiabatic shocks. And what we what, what we end up is that uh, the temperature of the hot bubble it goes as the velocity of the ejecta squared, and as the velocity is about a thousand kilometers per second, we end up with uh, temperatures uh, about a million or ten million Kelvin. Um, so this is what we expect to see in Novi, in Nova shells. But what about other nova remnants? And, and actually, there's uh, although there's a large number of X-ray observations of Novi uh, in the archives, most of them are just concentrated into characterizing the X-ray emission from the binary system. So what people are more interested in is the characterizing how is the light curve of the system, try to characterize orbital parameters and plasma interactions between these two, the, the, the two stars in the system. But in particular, um, because of this, so there, there's a large number of Chandra and XMM Newton observations, which we were able to analyze. And we started by this, one of the most uh, obs uh, observed novi, which is DQ Hercules, and they were waiting for us. So in 2003, uh, Mukai collaborators, they actually studied the X-ray emission from the central source uh, and they, they, they studied the, the spectrum and they, they, they predicted that the temperature of the, the star, it was something like 7 million Kelvin. Uh, and it had a very strong contribution from non-thermal X-ray emission. So, um, e and, sorry, they also predicted or mentioned uh, in their discussion that there's some extended X-ray emission around the star, but they did nothing about it. So, we jump immediately jump into these observations, and we actually detected that this extended X-ray emission it, it extends farther away from uh, or it, uh, from the nebula uh, emission. For example, here is uh, is a Chandra image that we produced. So you can see in red is the extension of the optical nebula. The blue contours is the extended X-ray emission and Contours in white is the central source of, this, of the, the central binary system. So um, let me just remind you that Chandra has a spatial resolution of one arc seconds, and this extended emission goes uh, about 32 arc seconds. So actually, this is result and is a real emission. So we actually are detecting some kind of like a bipolar emission, extended emission from this Nova shell. Um, there were also uh, XMM Newton observations of this source, and although XMM Newton has uh, less uh, or worse, a little bit less uh, uh, spatial resolution of about six R seconds, we can also see this bipolar uh, emission in, from the NOVA. And then again, the dashed line here is, is what the extension of the optical. Um, so you might remember, so luckily, we had optical observations of the, this Nova shell from 2017, which is the same year that the XMM Newton observations were taken. However, the Chandra observations were uh, obtained in 2001, and we did not have any optical observations on that specific year. And as I just shown you, this Nova has been expanding very fast, and, and within a few years, it is obvious that the expansion is uh, it's happening. So the optical image on the left is an image that we created from a, an image from 2000, uh, 1998, and we applied the expansion rate that we know and produced this synthetic uh, 2001 optical image. Uh, you can see that the shell is smaller than in the 2017 image, but still, one of the things that we see is that the, the, this bipolar ejection it's extends further away from the nebular optical emission. And they're both oriented, oriented in the same way, so we actually think we are demonstrating that this extended emission is kind of like real. Um, so what we see that the XMM Newton has a better uh, uh, effective uh, detection of photons, so we actually see kind of like hot bubbles filling up the nebular shell and then the extra contribution from this is kind of like a bipolar emission. 
Uh, so Chandra gave us the opportunity to uh, extract spec a spectrum from the central source and fold in the, the spectrum from the extended X-ray emission. So here in this figure, I am showing you in black the spectrum of the central source, which is more or less the same as MUKAI 2003. And then in orange is the spectrum of the diffuse X-ray emission. So you can actually see that the peak of both um, spectra is, is different, so the diffuse X-ray emission is softer. And actually, the temperature of the, the, the X-ray emitting gas in the, the extended emission is about two times uh, two million uh, degrees. And then again, we also need the contribution from a non-thermal X-ray emission. So this was a, kind of like a, a surprise too. But that is much is one thing that the central source of DQ Hercules has been classified as um, magnet magnetically active intermediate polar white dwarf. This uh, white dwarf exhibit uh, magnetic fields of about between one and 10 mega gauss, which um, uh, it's very interesting because uh, this is what we're detecting. We're detecting the contribution from a, a non-thermal, which is very likely a magnetic uh, contribution. And also uh, in 2010, Saito and collaborators, uh, they, they, they did this uh, spectral mapping technique and revealed that the, the disk, the disk is actually a spiral. The disk of the accreting material on the white door is actually a spiral. So the material is spiraling in before accreting onto the white door. This is just an image that I just uh, took from their, their paper. So what we, what we can, uh, with these two ideas, what we can think is, is that what's happening here is that um, this, this bipolar uh, X-ray emission is no, no more than a magnetized jet. So what we think is happening here is that material is accreted onto the white dwarf, but it's spiraling in. So the, the magnetic uh, torques are creating this, uh, the so-called hoop stress. So this hoop stress is actually taking material out of the disk and ejecting on, on the polar uh, directions. Uh, so actually this is, uh, if this is to be true, uh, we think we are witnessing the, the present presence of a magnetized jet and actually the first ever uh, detection of a jet in a NOVA system. It has never been detected a jet in a NOVA system. So let me just finish I, uh, with a couple of um, sentences, um, say that NOVA seem to uh, exist with a variety of shapes. Uh, this is very likely due to different formation mechanisms. The explosions are probably not homogeneous. Uh, the disks might be inflated or like a tori-like uh, uh, distributions. Probably it also depends on the interaction with the interstellar medium. Uh, I hope I, I, I proved that NOVI can be used as laboratories for a variety of fundamental astrophysical problems, plasma physics, stellar evolution, nuclear synthesis, and ejecta inter interstellar medium interaction models. All of this in human time scales. Um, the presence of a magnetized jet in this uh, DQ Hercules NOVI, NOVA has opened uh, a new field of study in NOVI. Uh, Maybe now we can start asking us ourselves if jets are ubiquitous in all NOVI or if the, the, the jet has a role in shaping the NOVA shells. Um, uh, sorry, I was supposed to click on this. And finally, uh, part of our work, of our future work, or our ongoing work, is to use, um, so NOVI are compact. Some, we, we have discovered that some of these are compact and they're very nicely suited for the uh, Megara GTC instrument, which uh, these are in integral field uh, spect spectroscopic observations and that we can use to unveil the true kinematics of the NOVA remnants and study their abundances. Um, we can actually exploit the X-ray uh, archives of all satellites to search for this extended X-ray mission, which, which they have not been exploited so far. And the next step will be to produce high quality radiation hydrodynamical simulations that we will be able to follow in detail the evolution of binary systems since the formation of disks, finally to the explosions and the runaway thermally, thermal explosions and production of all these heavy elements. Um, so thank you all for 
this thing that you needed to crack. Thank you very much, Jesus, for this uh, very nice talk. And now the talk is open for questions. Please, all the participants, raise your virtual hand and I will give you the possibility to ask a question to Jesus. Everything was super clear. <laughs> Seems to be very clear. Martin. Yeah, let me uh, yeah. let me make one one short question. Uh, the fact that there is uh, DQ Hercules is the only uh, nova where there has been the detection of a jet. Uh, it probably implies that the conditions for production of those jets has to be very very specific. So it's it's maybe not just a question of even having the magnetic fields, because there are many of those systems with a strong magnetic fields, but maybe there is enough material around at this moment to be accreted onto the onto the uh, accretion disk and then collimated through through a jet. Could you expect that the uh, that the collimation of this jet is going to be just a transitory phenomenon? Um, I wouldn't say it's transitory. I will say it has to be uh, happening most of the time, so happening in all times of the evolution of the, the interaction of the binary system. Uh, my impression is that, um, in general, most of the X-ray observations have been performed into very compact novi because normally people just request X-ray observations of like, recent explosions. And we let's say in, within 20 years that XMM Newton and, uh, and Chandra have been working, in these 20 years, most of these novi probably already have been expanded and we can actually point uh, with X-ray telescopes to unveil the X-ray properties. But my impression is that the jet must be uh, happening or forming as a continuous thing as, as long as you have the binary system interacting because saying that it will disappear or not, it implies that the magnetic field will disappear because that's what, what I think is the jet produced because of the presence of the magnetic field. Because as long as you have the binary system, the, the disk will be producing these spirals and the, the hook stress. Okay, then, then one prediction would be that systems that have strong magnetic fields and may also show these kind of uh, uh, features. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. Um, the problem is that, again, some of these observations were aimed to study the X-ray source, the binary system, and some of them are very short. Some of these observations are very, like four kilosecond observations. And in order to detect the extended X-ray emission, you need a little bit more time than that at least 50 kiloseconds. There is uh, another rising hand here, Isabel. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was just, I, I've been fighting with the mouse in order to, to find the arrow. Um, so, um, uh, as you know, I'm not an expert at all on this field, so probably I'm asking stupid things, but then, um, uh, since the, the, these these stars are are placed in in different I guess in different uh, uh, situations, so the the ISM is different for for them. Um, what could be your ideal information in order to know where is the ISM has an effect on the shape that you see? So do you have enough information on on how, I mean densities and compositions and magnetic fields and so on? And and, and if not, what would you do to to try to gather all those data. Yeah, um, that's, that's something that I've been struggling thinking lately. Um, because as I showed you in the beginning, so this NOVA that has created like a hundred parsec shell. Uh, so the same NOVA, so if some recent uh, shell, let's say, is ejected inside the shell. So this is actually not ISM. So this is actually 
material that has been ejected off from the nova. So, uh, so if a new shell is ejected very closely, it would interact with material from the self uh, system. Um, it's I would say it's difficult because it it will depend on the the position on the galaxy of the nova. For example, if it's in the galactic plane or not. Uh, and if the nova is the first explosion that the nova uh, experiences, because if it's the first explosion, uh, it will just interact with ISM. But if it's not, it will interact with the previous shells ejected by this, the nova. Uh, so this makes it very difficult in order to parameterize. So uh, we've been thinking on, on these simulations, and this is something that struggles me because initial conditions is, is what you start with in the simulation. And deciding what should be the, the density of the ISM is something that we need to think very thoroughly, carefully. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and I, I found it extremely interesting and, and, and really amazing. I, I love the videos with the evolution of the, these things <laughs> that you can see in our lifetime. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I take profit to thank you again for giving us a seminar. It's, oh, thank you. Yeah. Even if yeah, I am so not they, able to, to, to raise any other questions since because, because of my ignorance of the subject. But, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, so the images are actually amazing. This is a, a very nice tool. So we can actually do lots of things with this. Um, we are also thinking on, on producing um, neurological nets in order to, if we have an image, so we can fit a new neurological uh, net with what we know, the expansion of certain nebulae, in order to extrapolate that into other nebulae that we don't have multi-epoch observations and to trace their evolution back in time, for example. And we can actually start uh, uh, taking a look at the evolution of uh, other nebulae that we don't have this information because those that have been observed with different uh, epochs are the most uh, known cases. But there's a lot of nebulae out there. So. This, certainly, there's a lot of work to be done, mm -hmm. and people have only been concentrating in the properties of the binary system, which is, of course, uh, interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Any other question for Jesus? Here, uh, Gloria, yeah, please. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, uh, and thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm really happy to see those images of NOVE, since I was always working on NOVE as point sources. Um, there's one thing I just wanted to add, it's more a comment than a question. Uh, I've been basically all my life working on X-ray emission of NOVE, and we are not really just the system, we are more interested in what happens on the white dwarf and the ejecta. The only thing is that just short after the outburst, of course, we cannot resolve the shell. So we just follow the evolution of the ejecta short after the outburst, thanks to its spectrum in the X-rays. So there's a lot of information in the point-like source, but uh, grating spectra in the X-rays about the expansion uh, velocities, different components, different compositions or, or, or different, uh, yes, component, um, components of the shell with different compositions and temperatures. Okay, so that's something that will complement you, what you get in shell years later. So the day that you can resolve the shell of the nova that were observed during outwards, okay, that will be really good because in the outwards from the X-rays, you have all the information short after the outwards, expansion velocities and abundances and temperatures of this ejecta, very hot. And then you can follow that years later with your shells. So I think it's an information that you could complement um, in some years to go. <laughs> thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. This, this, of course, it's, it's, it's like that. So there's uh, uh, the X-ray emission of very young nobi. So some of the uh, X-ray observations were targeted towards very recent few days, a few months uh, explosions. But some of those uh, observations, uh, X-ray observations, were targeted at the uh, central engines of very well resolved nobi, for example, DQ Hercules. But uh, yeah, you're right. But X-ray observations of, of recent explosions can give you can give us that information of the 
uh, abundances or abundances and yeah uh, velocities lots of information yeah, of course we definitely have to take that into account okay well i maybe i can add something else so um, sure. one of the main interests in the x-rays short after the nova explosion is the super soft emission that comes from the remaining hydrogen burning layers on top of the white dwarf and this is actually the engine that is powering the whole thing right so we, we from the grating spectra in the emission lines we can characterize the ejecta but the soft component the bright soft component is uh, giving us information on the engine that is powering this expanding shell and this stays for several months or years and tell us how long you have this x-ray wind or x-ray emission powering and how much mass is left on the white dwarf. Yes. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Any other question for Jesus? If not. We thank again Dr. Jesus Tuala for this uh, very nice talk and uh, I will stop recording now. <laughs>